Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company and thank you so much for tuning in to another one of our talks as we continue to bring amazing creative voices from across the entertainment industry. Uh, today we're so fortunate, we're joined by the incredibly wonderful Megan Griffiths, who's an amazing writer, director, producer. She also spent several years working as an AD and as a cinematographer and an editor before getting her own projects off the ground and has had a really incredible career of feature films over the last several years, including The Off Hours, Eden, Sadie, and so many more and was recently also invited to join the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences as part of the director's branch, which congratulations on that. And I know that you've, you've already spoken a little bit about how obviously it's a huge honor, but it was a little bittersweet because Lynn Shelton was actually the one who kind of really shepherded that nomination and, and helped you to get that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me and, and for that. Um, I, I, yeah, that was something that she and I had talked about in January of this year, I think. And, uh, and so getting the, the, notification was was really exciting but also just kind of like you know just another fresh reminder of the loss of her which has been like pretty devastating this year yeah no she really kind of shepherded that seattle community that you guys have in terms of filmmakers and producers and yeah and so many other filmmakers are like i've just after she passed away like just watching the outpouring of, of grief from all corners there were so many people that she was connected to and reached in this film community and beyond that it was like I didn't even I mean I've known her for 15 years and so many of them I didn't even know she you know had connections with so it was like it was kind of inspiring to see how many people's lives she's touched. That's really beautiful and I love the fact that there is now a grant in her name of a certain age which is going to give $25,000 grants to women 39 and above to honor the fact that she came to directing at that point in her life and I was just curious about the way that you really hope that that's going to help bring new voices into the industry that maybe may not have gotten those opportunities and platform otherwise. Um, I mean I think Lynn didn't make her first feature till she was 39. She made her film We Go Way Back at that age and that's when she and I met. Um, and she had had this whole life before that, you know, she'd done still photography and theater acting and so many different things. And um, all of that life informed her work. And, uh, you know, from right out of the gate, like her work was so impressive. You know, I just revisited We Go Way Back and it's, it just has so, so much of her DNA in it. And it's just so, uh, it, it just shows the mind that she had and the, and the vision that she had, like right from the start. And I think, it's rare to say that about someone's first feature, but probably less rare when it comes to people who start a little later because they're so much more formed and like certain of their path and, and their choices. And, uh, and so this, yeah, the grant is, is hoping to, to be able to reach out and support other people who are like Lynn was, who were having, like she was having trouble getting support at that part of her career and sort of, it took, one organization to kind of, uh, you know, acknowledge her and lift her up. And then she had this insanely prolific career. And so I feel like hopefully that will come to pass with the next, with the grant winner for, for this grant each year. That's incredible. And I can't wait to see the voices that we get to experience as, as a too. result. Um, yeah. I wanted to also ask you a little bit about independent cinema and kind of what you're seeing on your side as a writer, director, producer, because I think there's a lot of concern that as we get back into production and we gradually start opening up, that independent cinema is actually one of the spaces that's going to suffer the most, just because the budgets tend to be lower. And obviously everyone, you know, wants to and needs to adhere to all these new safety protocols, but there's a huge cost that comes with that. Even just the cost of buying PPE or having a different catering structure that's not as cost effective. And I was curious if you've kind of seen conversations happening around that and how you think that's really going to affect the independent sector of the industry. Yeah, I've had so many conversations about like both sides because I work in TV a lot too. So there's a lot of shows that I was supposed to do this year that got sort of kicked off into the indefinite future. So there's conversations happening on that side and there's conversations happening on the indie side. And I was just having a conversation with a cinematographer friend and we were both saying like that sort of shrug emoji like sort of uh, is what represents our entire industry right now. Nobody knows like exactly what's happening, but it is wor the worrisome part really is the independent side because there really isn't like they can't you know self-insure necessarily and they don't the insurance is so expensive at this point which is good because we want everyone to get protections for 
this kind of hazard work that every, if everyone's going out into these environments where there's all these people, it's a dangerous thing to do right now. And so, you know, I'm glad there are so many conversations going on right now and I'm glad people are taking it really seriously, but it is, uh, I feel like big studios might be able to fold it into their um, expenses, but indie stuff, I might just either be going very, very small back to sort of that indie, very small indie roots and, or it, or it might just languish a little bit until this passes and hopefully at that point we'd come back with a bang. Yeah. Do you think that that's going to change any of the way that you and other writers think about the way that you're writing scripts? Because obviously, you know, even if things like background are going to have to go away or be really minimal for a moment, or there's a limit to how many actors you can have in a scene. And unfortunately, you always write these really beautiful, intimate films already that kind of fit into that scope a little bit. But is it something that you're starting to be cognizant of as you're thinking about other scripts that you want to write? Yeah, it's really interesting because I, I have written a lot of stuff that is really intimate and deals with like one or two people at a time on screen. Um, and, you know, often you're told as a filmmaker that that, you know, you want to, you know, increase your scope and make things feel bigger, you know, and like, you don't want to feel like it, your movie is too small. And right now it feels like those are the kind of stories that people are wanting to green light because there are so many questions that come into play when it's like, even just like a party scene or a grocery store scene or whatever. It's like all these, any scene that would typically require a lot of background is um, super hard to shoot right now. I just read, uh, I forget who it was talking about um, shooting with, they only had 15 extras and they had to stack them incredibly strategically to get like the, the shots that they needed because they were finishing a project that they had started before uh, everything changed. And so, uh, it just, yeah, it just sounds like right now those kind of intimate stories would be embraced. Um, I can't imagine that's, you know, I, I'm sure the balance will return, but, but yeah, I, I'm, I feel equipped to, to go and to deal with that because I love those interpersonal stories, you know, and uh, I, you know, with the TV work, I don't know if they're rewriting to get out of all of those stories or just going to try to figure out some sort of digital VFX solution to, you know, putting crowd scenes together. Yeah, like all of a sudden we'll have mass scenes with loads of CGI actors in them. Exactly. I really think that's, it's, you know, it's hard to imagine there being a real scene with a lot of that many people in it unless they're like, you know, testing every, every background performer and like, yeah, it's, it's such a, yeah, so many questions. <laughs> I wanted to ask you as well a little bit about the way in which you work with actors. I remember when, when Sadie came out that John Gallagher Jr. Was, was saying how, you know, especially for his character coming into that movie, where you don't necessarily see a lot of his backstory, that you really developed and crafted a lot of that for him. And I was curious if that's something that you tend to do for actors across the board, if it's something that you always put in place for them, or if that was something that was kind of more specific to that type of role in the way that he was coming into it. No, I do a lot of backstory work personally with if it's especially if it's my original script but even if it's something that I come on board sort of after the fact like I I, I did a film called Eden and it was um it was written by Rick Phillips and he had already done a draft of it um and but when I came on board I actually sort of did all this backstory work for a lot of the characters um on my own um because you can have a little freedom to just create something that makes the person who's on the page make sense to you. Um, because I just want to, especially with that movie, there was so many bad guys, you know, quote unquote bad guys. I just wanted to understand how they all landed in this situation. And like, you know, no one's like, I'm going to work at a human trafficking facility when I grow up. You know, it's like there was something, life experiences led them to this, this place. Um, so I was really curious to develop that and with um with Sadie and the off hours like I have you know I wrote those scripts and, and developed all those characters from the ground up so you know just to kind of understand who they were and and why they made the decisions they made it was really helpful for me to you know have full backstories and then I don't necessarily share them with the actors unless because sometimes the actors want to do that work themselves like I did with Eden you know it's like it almost doesn't matter if you agree on their backstory as long as they've landed the characters landed in that place you know and so he I think we worked together he wanted to to find out all that those details he was really interested in sort of diving into all this history and then when he was up 
in Seattle where we shot, he was, you know, taking his days off to go to the town that I sort of arbitrarily picked as where his character was from and sort of hang out at some places there and see what the locals were like and just kind of infuse that into his performance. So it, you know, all actors are different and have different processes, but he really was on board with that. My, my sort of backstory in becoming part of his process. Yeah, well, I feel like it feeds into something that you said in the past that I really love, which is how you, you feel the actors really respond to clarity and that that's mm. important for them to have from you. And I was, I was interested in kind of the way that you make sure that you can provide that because I think it's, especially with your career, it's one thing when you've written the script, you conceptualize that character, you know every single beat and rhythm and you really understand them and then you evolve them with an actor. But when you're coming into television where someone else has actually written the script, Kind of how do you set about making sure that you have that level of understanding so that you can give them the clarity that they need for their performance? Yeah, that's always a really interesting situation because you are coming into a situation, you know, you're coming into this world where they've been playing, I mean, especially if it's not the first season or like the first few episodes, they've, got, they've been playing that character for a while, these actors. And so, you know, they have a pretty strong handle on character. But for me as a director, I like to, you know, I read and re I read everything that exists up to the point of this episode that I'm doing. So if like I'm doing episode nine of the first season, I'll read all the different episodes leading up to it just to get, so I understand the world and the characters. Anything that's been shot, I will watch, you know, if there's rough cuts of early episodes or if there's previous seasons. So it's a lot of homework sort of going into it. And then when you get there, you know, I always have like a list of questions about you know the characters and why they're making certain choices or or why things are set where they're set or you know various things that come up when you're reading a script that isn't yours um and there is something called a, a tone meeting where you sit with the writer and usually other people from the production to just go through the script scene by scene and ask all those questions and they're sort of the writer usually walks you through their decision making process and tells you what beats are important to them and why they're there in that scene. So a lot of the character questions are answered in that process. And then um, when we're on set, uh, typically there's not always, but the, typically there's a, a person um, from, you know, the writing staff or the uh, showrunner is next to me the whole time to, to field those kind of more, those questions that draw upon things that weren't developed in this episode. Yeah. And also kind of similarly with TV directing as well, I feel like it's a skill that is often really underestimated in the industry to a degree mm. because everybody looks at it as, well, the world's already created and the director just comes in and they just have to set up a camera. And it's absolutely not that. There's so many other pieces that go into it. And so for you, what are, what are the, the kind of key things that you find that people don't always realize that you're doing behind the scenes but are so vital to that process? I mean, there is a level of having to really understand what the style of the world is, what the what the tone of the world is, what the, you know, how, there's all of that where you're sort of fitting yourself into something that ha is pre-existing, unless you're getting to, you know, direct a pilot, there is going to be rules that you're working within. So there, that's a good challenge for any given show. And typically you get hired for stuff that you're, um, my coffee maker's going off. Sorry, that's what's beeping. Um, <laughs> but um, typically, you're um, you're you come in and and you're you you understand like these are the parameters of the show. Sometimes they'll give you a lookbook. Often you'll just have stuff to watch. But um, so there's that's sort of the part I think people recognize from afar. Are like you're just going in and doing some, you know, executing someone else's vision. But you know, there's still work to be done. Like interpreting the script with the actors um there's i i always f try to find like what is the what is the reason this scene is existing what is the most interesting thing to me about this scene and often that comes about with watching the initial blocking rehearsals and like stumbling upon it and sometimes it's something i go into the day with but like getting digging into that thing that makes like that scene specific scene spark and then that you, you know just replicate that over and over again. But then there's also just like, you know, the challenge, the biggest challenge of the whole process in my mind is, is that you're just landing in the middle of a machine that is, that has existed before you got there and will exist after you leave. And, and you have to 
be the leader. And so it, I, I always say it's like paratrooping into the middle of a battlefield where it's like you're, and then you're the general, you know, it's like, you just got there. Everybody knows what they're doing and their interpersonal dynamics and everything. And you're the one who's supposed to tell them what to do next. And so it's, uh, a, that is something that took some getting used to for me um, because I came from the world of independent cinema where I was there. I was the first person there and then the whole crew grew around me to the point where we're on set and then they all shrunk down again and I was still the only person there at the very end after the edit was done you know or me and a producer you know so I was used to getting that ramp up ramp down and this was more like you're in it you know go forward um be confident be you know be a leader you know be certain you know certainty like with the actors you know just know what you want yeah I guess, especially even when you're walking into a space where you have to learn everybody's names, even. Oh my gosh, it's so hard. I'd like, sometimes people will do name tags and I love it, <laughs> but it's not something that they, you know, people want to have to mess with every day on a set, but it is so hard to, I really try to remember everybody's names. Um, and it is a, a challenge because it's like hundreds, it's hundred new people all the time, you know? Yeah. Right. And when you first stepped into TV directing, it was actually with Room 104, Mark and JJ Classes series. And that must have been such a fascinating world to step into for your first TV gig, because I imagine it's actually very different to the way that other shows operate, because it's got that anthology feel. So yes, there's kind of that bigger narrative arc and tone that sets the show, but each story kind of lives in its own way. So how is that just a completely different experience to everything that you've experienced since in television? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was like, um, it, it was such a great transition um, to be able to work on that before kind of do, doing the, all the other TV work that I've done, because it was like, I, I've compared it to directing a, you get to, everybody gets to do the pilot, you know, um, or like basically everyone gets to do a short film, you know, it's like the same idea you get to, you're so involved with casting and creating the style of your episode and, um, you know, you're given this room. And in my case, I was given two scripts, you know, written by Mark Duplass. And, um, but within that, I had so much freedom. Um, and like for a show of that size, which it's a pretty sort of scrappy show considering it's on HBO, at least it was in the first season. Um, the, you know, there was only, there was a very limited amount of paid sort of prep time and very short shoot and edit. And, and so, but the nice thing was that I was like ready to do, go, kind of go way above and beyond in terms of my prep. And um, there was space for that. Like I, I flew to LA because I live in Seattle. So I always have to fly everywhere for jobs. But like I came in early and, uh, and did a lot of, you know, weeks of prep when they think it was budgeted for days, you know, <laughs> you know, so it was, that was a really lovely thing for me because I felt very prepared by the time I got to set and I felt like a lot of ownership and I didn't feel like anyone was breathing down my neck to make specific choices. You know, I felt there was people there to ask questions to, but I was, I was, you know, when I was wanted to move on, we could move on, you know, with each setup. So that was, that's really different than the way a lot of shows run where, you, you know, you're landing in your, you get like sort of the rundown of these are all the actors and these are how they are to work with. And there's, here's their weird idiosyncrasies and um, same with some of the crew. And this is, these are the parameters of your show. You know, this, that one was like super free and just such a great first experience in TV. And it opened the door for me and so many other people who worked on it to get other TV work, which was eluding me <laughs> up to that point. That's amazing. And, you know, because you were mentioning earlier, you know, yourself making films that have those kind of like two people in a scene and those more intimate things. Did you find that your experience in the films that you've made really lent them? to coming into a show like that because you know if you look at an episode like missionaries there's literally only two actors on screen the entire time and and you really kind of have to specifically block and find a way to utilize this space in a completely new and different way from all the other episodes in, in moving your characters around and really making it feel fresh and innovative but you really just have that one room for the yeah. entire yeah there's a the the first scene in that episode i think is like nine pages or eight pages of dialogue of them sort of like coming in from hard day and then having this long conversation about you know this crisis of faith and uh I think that was probably the longest blocking rehearsal I've ever had um because it was such a challenge to find ways to keep it dynamic um and the actor you know Mark Duplass was super helpful in that too because he showed up that day with 
at the beginning of our day and just kind of helped at, from his acting background, like have ideas and, um, and yeah, try to get the characters moving around and in different spots, um, you know, from an indie background, it's like, and especially with having an AV background, I know how, you know, in my mind, I have to fight that thing, which is like every place that they, every news position that, that they, the actors go to has to be, you know, a new set of coverage and a new lighting setup, and, and it's going to expand our day in this way and that way. And that, you know, having that part of my brain is really useful, but it can also be a little bit like, can get in your way a little bit when you have a scene like that. So I really had to sort of bat that away and let it be, um, let it be discovered with the actors in the blocking rehearsal. Yeah, but there's such a huge value to having that specific AD background and really just understanding the minutia of those decisions and how every choice you make affects the entire day, the entire setup and the entire shoot. And, yeah. you know, I also imagine that it gave you such an incredible front row seat to a lot of directors and you, you were working also with first time directors and watching them kind of step into this new realm. And what were some of the things that from watching them and having that position and seeing how everything flowed, not just that you kind of learned, oh, that's how I want to run my sets, but what were some of the things where you went, oh, absolutely, I'm never going to do it that way, or oh, that's not <laughs> how to do that, <laughs> and some of the pitfalls that you were able to avoid because of it, potentially? It's hard to, like, pinpoint exactly what those things are. The big sort of overarching thing was that I, I feel like I watched a lot of first-time directors make decisions based in fear and, like, come to set with all this, like, uh, you know, fear, imposter syndrome, and like, I don't know what all these people do, um, and I don't know what my role is in the midst of this, you know, and um, so being able to watch someone else go through that and see the sort of negative effects of it, like sometimes it would like result in them shrinking, and sometimes it would result in them having like, you know, temper tantrums, and um, and it was, it, it was interesting for me to kind of understand what the root of all of it was, and um, to know that when I walk on a set, I have to know what I'm looking for. It's helpful to know what everybody does and what exactly my role is, because then I can feel sort of comfortable and ready to work, you know? So that was a big thing. And just like most of it was uh, being able to watch productions that didn't treat everybody the way I would like to see people treated and being one of the sort of below the line people you know and crew members and seeing how it affected my work and my desire to like give myself to the production and put everything into it when I felt like I was being scolded or abused or not, or taken advantage of so I always I took that forward and always and it wasn't everything I worked on it was certainly big exceptions to that but like I really took those lessons forward and uh, especially on the off hours which I I put together with three people who I met when they were also, you know, the producers of the off hours were also crew members with me. And so we were all like, we are going to treat people well. We are going to make an environment where everyone needs, is able to thrive. We're going to have a safe set for people to do their best work and the actors to feel comfortable. And so just bringing that forward, I think is the number one thing. Yeah, it's such a vital thing that brings out the best work in everyone. And, you know, I mean, one of the challenges is with being an AD and also with being a director is probably you do have to be very direct. There are very specific things that you need from people. You have to be that person that pushes people along at, at certain points of the day. And, and you've kind of mentioned previously how it goes a little bit against your internal nature to be a little bit more shy in situations like that. So how did you kind of navigate having to almost evolve what your communication style was going to be on sets as you discovered that and found what your voice was going to be and giving those directions but like you said and making sure that everyone at the same time always just feels appreciated to be able to do their best work yeah it's funny i think ading was harder for me to transition to than directing because um it, with directing i can still have a lot of private conversations hopefully i still can in this era of covid like where people can't be close to each other but like um like with ADing, you you're constantly, you know, informing the whole crew of things, you know, and so it it, it was that one was a really had to sort of like fake it till I made it where I was just like, I'm going to be this person now. This is how I have to be in order to effectively do this job, and it was more of a like role I was playing, um, but it also kind of led to me not sort of gaining that confidence and that certainty. So by the time I was back on set as a director, um, that was there a little bit more than it had been before. And so I could, you know, have that certainty of like knowing that 
what I was, you know, these choices that I was making, I knew what effects they would have on people. And I knew the information individual crew members and cast members needed from me in order to go do their job. Um, so I got all this insight from that process and I got a little bit of just that natural comfort of existing on a set and being, and knowing my place on that set and, and my role and my, and how important it was for me to just lead, you know? Yeah. And also in terms of, of producing, because you haven't just worked on your own projects, you've also produced films that other filmmakers are putting together. And I imagine that there must be a huge value to that role as well. Again, just like getting to be up close. But also I was interested in the way that that's really evolved the way that you work with producers on your own projects and really kind of understanding their day-to-day -day process and exactly why they're making certain choices, why they're saying no to something, why they're pushing back on, it, on, on decisions. And, and how has that really shifted and evolved the way that you work with producers in your own movies? Yeah, no, it's, you know, having done any job aside from directing informs directing in a great way because you have that empathy that's built about, I know what you're dealing with. Let me try to help you while still maintaining the thing that I need, which is, you know, having, trying to build that trust with a producer is really help, is really great because you're, um, there's always going to be compromises to be made. And I would rather be part of that conversation and creating the compromises that don't compromise the vision, but that like get to save the money or save the time, um, than have anybody else's ideas sort of forced upon me. I'm like, this is how you're compromising your movie or your, or your episode. Um, so coming to the table with ideas and being open and not defensive and all that stuff is informed by having had been on the other side of that table. Um, for both, you know, producing and ADing and shooting and editing. You know, it's nice to just have done the job and understand the pitfalls and the challenges of it and then and then be able to work that into all the things you need to ask of people as a director. Yeah, and in a similar way, you know, you went through the self-distribution um, process with Sadie. Has that kind of evolved how you, you see yourself working with distributors when you work with them again in the future for other projects as well, just again, knowing literally exactly what it takes on the back end and, you know, yeah. direct goes into it and all the decisions <laughs> that they have to make and all the work that they have to do. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have a little bit more, like, um, empathy for what the what distributors have been going through when I've been sort of bemoaning, you know, you know, a lack of theatrical openings or whatever, you know, like various things along the process. It's hard to do it. It's a, not an easy job. It was a really, really challenging um, experience to self, to sort of produce the distribution of Sadie. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't, I am curious to see, you know, on the next, by the time I get to the point where anything else is being distributed, I, I'm curious to see like what the landscape looks like because it evolves so fast and, um, and it is such a challenge these days, I think more so than it ever has been to get your work to rise above all of the noise. There's so much material to watch. There's so much good stuff to watch. So even if you make something that you think is really good and worthy, it's still like you're trying to get someone to watch it over a bunch of other good and worthy things. So it's, it's yeah, it's hard. <laughs> And you also, you know, again, with that specific film, you took that to a lot of communities that maybe don't have access to art house cinemas and it allowed you amazing opportunities to do Q and A's and have conversations with people who had maybe never had that experience before. And did that kind of open your eyes to the way that people view films outside of our kind of little film industry bubble that we exist in a lot of the time? Yeah, I mean, that was really, that was the, absolute bottom line best part of go of going out with Sadie because I traveled with the movie a lot and I did you know I went to everywhere where we had like a, a theatrical thing or most of the places we had them but I went to every place we had a university screening or a, a community center screening so we went to all these places a lot of times my producer Lacey Levitt was with me um, sometimes Sophia Mitri Schloss who was the star of that film came to some of them but um, to go to these university settings and places where, and other places where there were art house cinemas was really great because there was all these really sort of 
uh, receptive audiences who don't get necessarily a chance to meet directors and ask their questions after a movie. Sometimes they were really, really great conversations that happened with, uh, with audience members during the Q&A and then sometimes even after the Q&A they would just keep come up and keep asking things and um, it just felt so rewarding to get to talk to people who were so engaged where sometimes when you go to New York and LA where people have those opportunities all the time they don't really feel as uh, as sort of lit up by the experience. Um, and Sadie was a movie that was made and completely designed to be a conversation piece. And so to have those opportunities to have the com conversations with everybody after we screened it was just the best part of that experience. That's amazing. And also, you know, kind of in similar vein in terms of connecting with audiences, I love the fact that you're always constantly writing pieces for places like the Talk House and, and blogging and really kind of engaging in that way as well in writing think pieces about the industry as a whole, but also other people's projects and, and taking your lens to, to different projects that come out. And I was, I was interested in what the value for you is in, in really taking an analytical lens and looking at other projects in that way is for you. Yeah, I don't know. It's like weird. Sometimes, a couple times, the like uh, the talk with the talk house pieces. It's been Nick Dawson, who yeah. uh, is the editor of that, like reaching out and saying, "Do you want to write about something this month?" Sometimes it's just been like I wrote. I like after the 2016 election, uh, my uh, boyfriend at the time, now husband, and I did a sort of self-imposed like political film festival where we just watched all these things, I guess, trying to make sense of like what had just happened in our world. And um, and then I reached out to Nick and said, I want to write about this. And he was like, great, here's a platform for it. And so, so it's worked, but a lot of times it's just, I really have a desire to write something about um, certain topic. I have my own blog to really like talk about like my experiences in the industry, but to have places like Talk House to put my work up in like, you know, talk about films I admire. Like this last year, I wrote a piece about Portrait of a Lady on Fire, and the year before, I wrote a piece about um, uh, You Were Never Really Here. Um, because, you know, they'll ask for a top 10 every year, and then I always have something at the top of my list. And then when I get the opportunity to write about it, it's so exciting because I get to just dive into what makes me so excited about that specific piece of cinema. So, yeah, I, it's just fulfilling to me to do when I have opportunity and time to, to to dig into something like that and just kind of try to make sense of my own thoughts. Yeah. And one of the things I love overall about your approach and your career is that you're so involved and entrenched in the community beyond just your own projects. And I was interested in hearing a little bit more about the ways that you feel like you've really been able to help other people get their projects off the ground or just kind of be a sounding board and really to help elevate other filmmakers because it's such an important thing in the industry, not just to focus on your own projects, but to really look at the wider scope of other voices as well. Yeah, I mean, I hope that you, usually if I have a producer credit on something, that's been something that I feel like I can, I can help get it made somehow. You know, I, my friend Todd Real Hall, who I've known since we were in film school together, like two decades ago, um, always has this, these stories that I want to see made, and they're not necessarily always easy to get made, but it's a voice I think should exist on the screen. And so I just try to find a way to be helpful in getting them made and and you know produce producers wear a lot of hats and I'm not necessarily comfortable sitting under all of those different hats you know there's parts of that job I I feel like I'm I can add and and some stuff where I just you know have to have a partner who can tackle some of those other stuff some of those other roles but like um but yeah it's usually just I I I see something, if I can, if I see a, an avenue for me to c go in and be useful and getting that thing made, I will dive into it. I don't do it that often in that role, but like off, uh, the other ways, it's just like watching rough cuts and, and um, reading um, earlier drafts of things and giving notes. And I always try to give notes the way I'd like to get them, which is like, direct, honest, tell me exactly how you feel and if you could figure out why you feel that way, even better, like what is it about this decision that isn't working for you, what isn't resonating, you know, those like, you know, it's nice to have compliments around your work too, but it's, it, it's uh, you know, you always want to know what is working and not just what's not working, but, um, but it's great to be able to really feel like you're getting detailed feedback and so that's where I feel like I really I, I try to give the kind of feedback I like to get when I'm 
when I'm working, uh, you know, looking at other filmmakers stuff, things, so. Yeah, and on kind of a totally different note, um, you were mentioning how you got married right at the beginning of COVID in the middle of March, and it was pretty much, you know, the week that everyone was trying to figure out, okay, do we close film production? Some were closed, some were still happening, and, and all of that. So I imagine that you had to completely reimagine your entire wedding in probably a matter of days. And I was interested in how your, actually your film experience was a really valuable thing to have at that point, to be able to reproduce your entire wedding and that event. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure it was like incredibly useful because, you know, people kept saying when I was planning their our sort of larger original wedding, um, do you need help? Do you have, you know, do you have it under control? Are you stressed out? And I'm like, no, it's like planning one shoot day, you know, like I can do this. Like it's, you know, you got the, you got the catering, you got the you got seating, you know, you know, I know my script, he has his script, we're the actors, uh, we have costume and makeup and all this stuff. It's like, I, I, I was approaching it like that. And then we did have to do a really rapid shift um, because we got married on March 14th, which is the week that everything was really changing rapidly. We did not, like, uh, we canceled our bigger wedding on the Tuesday of that week, and the wedding was Saturday, and we would have lost our venue on that Friday, but we hadn't yet when we canceled it. We, it was still available to us, so we would have lost it the day before the wedding, and then we ended up shifting to this very small beach wedding with just a few selected people on either side um, and that beach was available to us on that Saturday but closed on the Sunday to public use so it was like we really it was just such a shifting world it was a very very strange week but having that ability to you know okay new location let's get the permit you know just like having you taking the production mentality was was good it helped well, I'm glad it all came together. I know it wasn't kind of what you envisioned, but it, if it had been even a week later, it probably would have been a very different story. And oh yeah, had the time to spend together at home these last few months, and hopefully yeah. and it was it was beautiful. We'll have the we'll have a bigger yeah. party at some point. Hopefully, when people feel like hugging again, I hope that happens at some point. I would miss hugs if they went away forever, but um, but I I think that that what we were able to pull off on in that week and for that day was so special and so I'm I'm glad we had the wedding we had too even though it was a kind of a mess that week. <laughs> well that's so incredible and congratulations and thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat with us. Oh my pleasure thank you so much it was really fun. Thank you.